we are moving to the United Kingdom and uh, to another project that has to do with using LARP to shed some light on what's in the society and on some social issues. Uh, Jamie Hopper is an artist and a LARP designer from, um, from the United Kingdom. He has been also working with uh, theatres for people with less opportunities. And today he will tell us about the lowland clearances. Please give a hand to Jamie Hopper. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, just so you know, the, uh, the photographs that will come up are entirely random, so I'm just gonna kind of click the button at regular intervals and hopefully in some way the pictures will connect somehow with what I'm saying. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm here, uh, I'm here to talk about co-creating political landscapes in theatre-based LARP and with specific reference to a piece called The Lowline Clearances, which I made with a, a co-designer called Duncan Hay at Camden People's Theatre in London last year. Um, before I go any further, I should probably, if we're talking about political landscapes, I guess I want to start off by saying that I think all landscapes that are inhabited by some kind of living being are political, whether it's animals vying for territorial control or children negotiating the minefield that is the playground or property developers in London knocking down buildings to create regeneration projects. All of these landscapes are politically loaded if there are people or living beings within them. And the theatre is no different. Uh, so, from our sort of institutional knowledge of theatre, we know that theatre is a politically loaded space. The person or, or people who own a theatre space get to exercise a lot of control over what happens. It, it can be an owner or a curator that controls what happens in that space. Also, the director as a figure of control within the theatre can steer, guide or direct what happens within the performance space. And then we have the audience who come into a theatre building and, and sit in a, a binary relationship between the sort of the sacred space of performance and a relatively passive position uh, in an audience. But at this point, I want to say that I, I'm not here to argue that spectatorship is a bad thing. Um, I think that as spectators, provided that you're conscious, which hopefully everybody is here, uh, as long as you're conscious, you're always actively interpreting what's being shown, you're always thinking actively about what you see and what you hear. The question that I'm interested in asking is what people do with their interpretations, having watched, having heard, having experienced something as a spectator, how can you then take that stimulus uh, into some type of action in the world? Now this, um, there's a slide. Uh, this, th this, this question of what you do when you watch and then act was very much at the heart of the work of the Brazilian theater practitioner, Augusto Boal, who many people may be familiar with. Um, Boal essentially wanted to turn the spectator into a spect actor. So he would show the spect actor uh, a scene, which typically would show some type of oppression. And then the spect actors would be invited to then step into the sacred space of performance and play the scene out again in order to try and change the way that that drama would unfold and, and in, in Boel's terms, try to overcome that oppression. So lots of theatre directors like me who've formed an interest in types of interactivity see Boel as a really influential and, and seminal figure because he wanted to kind of offer that, that agency to a spectator to become a spectator. The limitation uh, of Boel is that typically he would look at single scenarios. So single scenarios, quite short scenarios where you would focus on a protagonist um, and you would try to kind of make things happen differently in the life of the protagonist. But we know that life isn't just about singular linear stories about how one person's life is oppressed or frees itself from oppression. We know that life's about broader systems um, of social experience. And from my point of view as a theatre director, thinking about wanting to invite forms of interaction with an audience, LARP seems to be really useful because it all usually offers more time for the players to engage in a, a deeper and broader consideration of social scenarios 
and also to consider the transformative potential within those scenarios. There's another slide. So coming to the low-line clearances, um, the aims that we, we had, myself and my co-designer, was to, was to create a, a, a LARP for the first time in, in both our cases, where we would give the players, a theater audience coming to the event, time to build, live in, and transform a community. Now, the historical context of the, of the piece is, is based on the, the phrase, the lowland clearances, which is sort of a bit misleading. It refers to um, a historical phenomenon in Scotland uh, in the late 18th century, where smallholder farmers were cleared from the land in order to kind of promote more industrialized farming. But that's not the, <laughs> that's not the subject of this LARP. We just thought that was a useful title. Our inspiration for this LARP was actually about a similar type of clearance that happened in North London in the Summerstein area in the mid 19th century when about 30,000 people were cleared from that area in order to make way for the development of three very large railway stations in the area, King's Cross, St Pancras and Euston. Many of you may have encountered them in your journeys through London. So essentially, we were looking at uh, exploring this story about how a residential area was transformed into an industrial area over a relatively short time with a large number of people being displaced. And the reason why we wanted to kind of look at that historical context was that we were interested in the contemporary context. Um, since 2010, uh, under the kind of the austerity measures of, of recent governments, lots of um, housing estates for people on low incomes in London are being cleared away uh, to make way for private regeneration projects. And Camden People's Theatre are a theatre who wanted to investigate this question. They have a, a kind of a long-term program of work called Whose London Is It Anyway? And so this LARP was an attempt to address this question, to look at um, the contemporary clearances within London through the frame of a, of a historical parallel. So the invitation we wanted to make then was to consider the theme of urban transformation, uh, make a LARP, which as I've said was the first LARP for me and also for the co-designer, Duncan. Um, and we wanted to invite a theater audience to come into this as players. We wanted them to come in as players and then reappropriate the theater space. So whereas the, the sacred space of performance usually says to the people in the audience, don't come any further than this, we wanted to invite people to cross that threshold, reappropriate the space, construct a community, live in that community, and then play a part in transforming it. Now, the space, which is sort of shown in some of these pictures, I think was quite useful and quite appropriate. It really helped us to issue that invitation because you can probably see from the pictures that it wasn't really a theater space. It happened to be the basement within the theater. And there was something useful about the fact that it was a nondescript, non-theater space. There were no fancy lights. There was no fancy sound system. There was no threshold to cross. And so the simplicity of this space made it a lot easier to issue that invitation to players. And in a way, you know, our, our thought here was to, to decisively move against the immersive theater tradition that's very prevalent in, in the UK, which is to kind of invest a lot of effort, not to mention financial resources, in creating these elaborate, immersive uh, environments. We took inspiration from the saying by uh, Gabriel Whiting or Weeding of Nooks, uh, who you said immersion is the excrement of action. We thought this was an excellent saying. And we, we, we viewed this as being a, a way of thinking about how we wanted our, our players to immerse, not through an environmental immersion, but by offering them the affordance to take immersive action uh, by constructing this world. And it was a world constructed, as you can see, out of nothing other than whatever random junk I could assemble. So the building of the world had several parts. It started off with the building of a monument or a totem. Uh, and then people who came in would find various materials. They would use these materials to build miniature houses, kind of like the kind of dens you build when you're a child. And looking back at the project, this den building for me was, is still the most successful aspect of the project because the process of building these things felt very personal, very precious. And because of this preciousness, because of this personal intimacy of building a house and then having neighbors, suddenly these landscapes became 
very highly charged and very high stakes. People were invested in protecting them. In terms of the character development, um, the different areas of the space were divided according to class, upper class, middle class, lower class. And so if you built a house in a certain area, you would then acquire a character of that class. And the way we built the characters was to use pictures. Um, so the, the, the pictures were of characters of these three kind of generic class groups from around 1850. So we, we kind of searched an archive of these pictures and then made them available to players that could choose one and then build the character from that. And we find that to be surprisingly effective. We were thinking, how on earth are we going to get people to play um, mid to late 19th century London? We, we don't want people to have to don Dickensian costumes and imagine that they're in a, in a Charles Dickens novel. And it turned out that the picture actually worked pretty well. People were able to take the picture and then use that to promote imagination. And so they would, in this nondescript room, they would look around and they would imagine the landscapes of Victorian London, slums, factories, parks, pubs, bordellos, drug dens. And some of these places would then become important social spaces within the LARP. So when people had built these spaces, built these characters, they would also imagine problems in these places, the kind of the social problems that exist in a Victorian slum. So they would think about things like the need for jobs to you know, promote prosperity, the need for uh, sanitation and, and greater public health facilities. And then the question for us as designers was, OK, people imagine these problems, so how are we going to invite them to go about solving them? So our answer wasn't to create a democratic distribution of power amongst the many. It was to put power in the hands of the few, and specifically the people who owned the land. And the people who owned the land were played by actors. Uh, and this was a fact that was made completely known to everybody taking part in the LARP from the beginning of the workshop. Now this use of a team of actors within the LARP was, was criticized. One reviewer uh, criticized the activity of actors because it seemed to kind of suggest that there was a form of railroading going on, like we heard from Martin's talk at the start. The suspicion was that these actors were here to do some plot and uh, drive the LARP towards a predetermined conclusion. Now, this wasn't the case, but it was a salutary reminder for me that if you've got actors in a theater space, it almost automatically creates the impression that there's going to be some form of performance going on and some kind of story that's going to unfold towards a predetermined conclusion. Nonetheless, I strongly believe that it's possible to view actors within LARPs as players in the same way that everybody else is a player. And I think it's possible for this role to go beyond the role of the NPC, to go beyond the role of the uh, non-player character who's there as a functionary to help kind of steer things and move things along. In this LARP, we wanted our actors not to steer towards predetermined conclusions, not to serve uh, desired outcomes from us as designers, but purely to serve the interests of their characters. So the actors, alongside all other players, would devise their character in the workshop like everybody else. They knew a lot more about the game, but their activity in the LARP was always in service of their character desire, not to try and make the LARP work better. Having said that, clearly, the actors in the LARP weren't equal to public participants. The actors had more knowledge of the LARP because they play-tested it several times. And also, they were landowners. Uh, so they had the affordance of having much greater control over what could happen. And it could be said that it's unfair to make public participants subordinate in this way. But I come back to that by saying that if life is full of people subordinating others, if life is full of figures of transcendent power subordinating other people, why would LARPs be any different? And I would suggest that in relation to this one, it would have been wrong to create dispossessed characters who somehow have an illusion of empowerment when actually they are the dispossessed. So in thinking about this combination of uh, powerful figures in the dispossessed and of, in thinking about a politicized LARP, I'm very keen on promoting the idea that we should embrace limiting structure and embrace the systems that actually promote oppression so that we recognize that agency and empowerment aren't the same. 
We don't necessarily need to empower our players in order for them to have agency. So in other words, it's possible for uh, a, a character with very few affordances to still have agency if the design has a responsive systemic framework. And in the case of the low-line clearances, there's another slide. Um, the systemic framework of this LARP design included six pre-authored events. So essentially, we as designers looked at the historical context and we created six large-scale transformations of the urban space which were pre-prepared, such as building a railway which might promote jobs or building a sewerage system to promote public health. Sounds like lots of fun, doesn't it? Um, now, the landowners could choose to enact these different uh, events if they met certain conditions, but similarly, the public participants as players could also pursue the enactment of these events, again, if they met certain conditions. And if one of these events was enacted, it would create a new context. So a macro-political event would occur, and then the players were free to then imagine what the micro-personal consequences of this political event would be. So each time one of these macro events occurred, people would then have a space to imagine what the, what the consequences would be and the, the miniature personal stories that they were engaged in. I'm just going to go back through the pictures again. So this, this, uh, this combination of, uh, of uh, structure and flexibility for players creates a bit of a tension. So I was creating a, a systemic frame, uh, but the players were playing freely and trying to imagine a new world. And there's a tension in that. And I think it was partially, but not wholly successful. So the range of these different possibilities created a, a, a big plurality of what could happen in the, in the LARP. And over the course of six playings, lots of different landscapes were created from utopian collectivist worlds to you know, full-on class warfare. But people still, I think, at times felt frustration about the fact that there was a limitation of, of these options. I would argue that since life doesn't kind of put you in a position where you're free to do whatever you want, neither should LARPs. But I'm also mindful of the fact that if I've invited people to build a world, it's entirely reasonable for them to expect that they'll have the opportunity to rebuild it in various different ways. The other problem that I think we had in the LARP was that there was too much personal intimacy. Um, so the people who were the power, broker, power brokers in this LARP were right next to the players, and they developed close personal connections. But in the real world, the people who wield power in making decisions about evicting thousands of people usually purposefully stay well remote from the people who are affected. So the fact that these power brokers were right next to the people that they were about to potentially uh, harm um, created a, a situation where they were very susceptible to ethical and moral arguments. So in the same way that I'm kind of arguing for a kind of a combination of this sort of macro um, system design alongside sort of micro personal play, I'm also keen on the idea of combining an understanding of politics and political arts at both a molecular and molar level. So if you're curious about these terms, a guy called Mackenzie Wark, who's a media theorist, talks about the difference between molar entities, the big structural constructs that shape our lives, governments, corporations, religions, versus the molecular life that happens with individual humans. And that if we're looking at the modern political world, and we're looking for solutions within this modern political world, we should look for understandings that occupy both the molecular level and the structural molar level. For LARP designers, what does that mean? For me, I think it means a continued focus on the intimate, the personal, the sensory, but also a focus on big structure, rules, systems, these things which apparently don't seem so sexy for LARP design, but I think are worth paying attention to. And I think that if we as LARP designers and LARPers have a combination of looking at things on a molecular and molar level, we can, we can begin to do what the philosopher Jacques Rancière calls the redistribution of the sensible. So if you think about the world with all of its range of things that we can perceive through our senses, we can look at those and we can reorder them selectively to create new worlds. So I'd like to think of this as being both an aesthetic process and a political process. On the molecular level, on the personal, the sensory level, 
we reshape the things that are in our immediate surroundings, but those actions then become political as they begin to influence larger molar structures. So to finish off, I'd like to suggest that the co-creation of these political landscapes in theatre-based LARP isn't just about entering the sacred space of performance. And it's not just about co-creating action within that reappropriated space. It's also looking at the interactions between the micro and the macro, interactions between the play and the game. And that if we engage with these larger molar structures, we can also look at how molecular personal action can begin to crack them and change them to create new imagined worlds. Thank you.